thank you, Chris. Um, so I've been introduced, so I better get on with it. <laughs> okay, so uh, Bulletin 96 is guidelines for submerged floating tube bridges. So what is a, a submerged floating tunnel? Um, there are two terminologies, uh, SFTs and SFTVs. So submerged um, is below the water surface, floating, um, it has buoyancy and a tunnel, it's a passage through a barrier. Um, so the, the guide lines that have been prepared, um, they're prepared for submerged floating tube bridges. Uh, and there's a term in Norwegian, uh, which I can attempt to pronounce, uh, um, which uh, describes a tube bridge. And uh, that's, that's the terminology that's been selected for this bulletin rather than a submerged floating tunnel. Um, the guidelines uh, published uh, around about, um, must be 12 months ago now. I'm not sure of the exact date. And um, the, the various sections in the, uh, the document are, are given there um, on, on the left there. And I'm, I'm gonna take you through um, those sections of the, uh, of the guidelines uh, after I've given you some background on the, uh, on the concept. So if you have to uh, um, cross water and it's particularly, uh, particularly deep, then uh, there's a number of ways of doing that. <clears throat> you may be able to put a, a bridge across, um, such as a suspension bridge, if the, uh, the span is not too far. Um, you could uh, tunnel underneath, uh, below the water, um, uh, but that depends on how deep it is and uh, uh, how far the crossing is. Um, you could decide to have a, a floating um, bridge supported by pontoons. Um, you could decide to have a, a number of um, uh, suspension bridges with a, a tension leg platform in the middle. Or you could have uh, an SFTB, submerged floating tube bridge. Now there's uh, not much new in, uh, in civil engineering technology. Um, the, uh, the, first, the, the idea was first uh, put forward by a, a British uh, naval architect back in 1886 in relation to uh, crossing the English Channel. Um, and then in the 1920s, uh, a patent was published in, in Norway for a submerged pontoon bridge. Um, there have been some um, examples of SFTBs uh, in, in, that have been actually constructed. Um, so there was a, um, a pipeline a shore approach um, tunnel, if you like, um, structure was, uh, was built in the, in the 1980s um, in Norway. Uh, more recently, there is the Söderström tunnel uh, in Sweden, in, in Stockholm. Uh, and that's, um, it's like a, an SFTB, but it's actually supported by columns. Uh, and I guess a key difference with, um, with a true SFTB is that it, uh, it floats within the water and it's, it's not, doesn't have a, a fixed, uh, fixed support beneath it. Uh, but certainly the technology that's been employed in this column supported structure is, is pretty similar uh, to what we're anticipating for SFTBs. Now the, the SFTB technology can draw from uh, uh, floating bridge technology, such as uh, uh, this shown here, which is uh, a floating bridge in, uh, in Canada. And there's a 50 year history in uh, offshore concrete structures being deployed in the, in the oil and gas industry primarily, uh, which can be drawn upon. Um, there's also technology, again, from the, from the oil and gas industry primarily, um, use of semi taut moorings, uh, which can give you um, a stiff mooring response um, for, a, for a relatively lightweight um, mooring system using um, synthetic, synthetic ropes. Um, 
There are also uh, tether technology, again, that's been deployed uh, in the, the oil and gas industry to date. Um, that's uh, been used for tension leg platforms to, to hold them to the seabed. Uh, and uh, the same technology is, uh, is proposed for SFTBs. So I think we'll find that um, SFTBs are a, they're a combination of existing technologies. Uh, no one part of it is new, but the combination is, is novel uh, and uh, you know, has not yet been uh, implemented. So moving on now to uh, what's, uh, what's, in, what's in the guidelines, um, starting off with uh, uh, rules and regulations. And I should say the, uh, the guidelines are principally for designers and owners. Um, there is another document being uh, prepared by the uh, ITA, which is um, primarily to, uh, um, to help with owners thinking about uh, um, developing uh, a submerged floating tunnel, uh, but um, um, the FIB document does concentrate more on the, uh, the design and the functional requirements aspects of the tunnel, uh, both structurally and also for the ancillary systems. Um, so it starts off with um, rules and regulations and um, relevant standards that could be adopted, uh, you know, include the likes of Eurocode, um, ISO standards, DNV, uh, guidelines. Uh, there will be other standards used, uh, such as the, the FIB model code, um, maybe AASHTO standards for highways uh, and such like. Uh, and it needs supplementary provisions. So there's um, need provisions in relation to uh, um, the buoyant aspect of the uh, SFTB, um, aspects of floating stability, um, needs to deal with the temporary phases during construction, which are quite important for an SFTB. And the key supplementary provision uh, for concrete design relates to, to water tightness. Um, uh, at the moment, you won't find particularly um, a comprehensive guidance in, in, say, the likes of Eurocodes for this, this application. Um, and I guess the, the, the first, um, first step really is to ensure that um, you have net compression in the section under service loads. Um, that would be the, uh, the starting point in any design, I think. Um, the other aspect that needs uh, prov provision is choice of safe safety level. Um, you know, what's it, what is the um, um, probability of failure for any, any element or the, this uh, SFTB in, in its totality. Uh, and that ties into the, um, the overall safety considerations of having um, you know, a transport system based on a, a submerged system, which could potentially flood. Um, then there's a chapter on functional requirements and um, there's a, a whole number of functional requirements, traffic, safety, operation and maintenance, uh, environmental regulations, the structure, uh, installations, layout and alignment, um, all of which can be defined uh, by uh, the client uh, commissioning um, an SFTB. Um, and there's some guidance in this chapter on uh, what, what you ought to consider in terms of uh, these aspects when setting down the functional requirements for an SFTB. Then there is a development of the cross section. Um, the, there needs to be space allocation uh, for uh, the traffic. It could be, could be a, a road only, could be road and rail as, as shown here. Uh, and you need provision uh, for people to uh, escape if there's an incident in one of the tunnels. So um, um, all the um, SFTBs being proposed to date, they have um, a means of crossing between uh, the two bores. Um, and obviously they have two separate, two separate tunnels for, the, uh, uh, for running in each direction uh, is generally the way it's laid out. And even if they're merged together, um, you will still have this separation of the two, um, two running um, uh, 
tunnels or lanes, carriageways, uh, and the provision to be able to uh, move between them. And you need to think about uh, ventilation. Um, uh, long tunnels um, uh, generally have um, uh, ventilation, and um, this has become increasingly a requirement in, in all tunnels that uh, are being developed nowadays. Um, the, there is uh, an extensive requirement to uh, uh, ensure ventilation and um, to uh, ensure and safety, say, in the event of a, a fire inside the tunnel. Um, the, the length that you can uh, have without uh, you know, an intermediate vent is increasing with time, uh, but uh, it is possible to introduce an intermediate vent uh, structure as part of your submerged tunnel if, uh, if that's what um, the ventilation considerations uh, dictate. So now looking at uh, the types of uh, SFTB. So one is tether supported, um, where you have um, tethers to the seabed in uh, periodically running along the uh, tunnel sections, um, as opposed to a pontoon supported where you have a, a buoyant element which cuts the surface, and then the uh, the structure is uh, supported below that. And um, clearly, the the pontoon supported structure has um, is visible from the surface, whereas the tether supported one is not. Uh, and that may be an important consideration in terms of uh, um, you know the functional requirements of the uh, SFTB. To decide which which, um, which which method you would prefer to uh, to use. Um, then looking at um, the influence of site conditions on the SFT, um, uh, the bathymetry and seabed conditions are important. Soil conditions and geology are important for um, uh, geohazards and also for finding uh, anchors and tethers. Um, if you're pontoon supported, then uh, wind uh, is a consideration. Um, waves are uh, a design consideration for uh, the submerged and uh, surface piercing portions. Um, you've got to consider water level variations. If you've got the pontoon supported uh, uh, structure, um, it will rise and fall with the tide. Um, and you need to think about shipping traffic um, that. Uh, is in the uh, is in in the vicinity of the crossing. Um, so then there's a chapter on load and load effects. Um, the uh, the largest loadings that are on the structure are self weight and buoyancy, uh, and then the the live load of traffic is somewhat uh, somewhat smaller, uh, and then there are important deformation loads that are ship impact. Um, cases to consider, and there's a number of other accidental loads, say uh, accidental flooding to be considered. Uh, and then um, the environmental loads that are acting uh, uh, can be transversely or vertically on the, on the section. Um, so the approach to design, um, you need to uh, first develop um, your rational cross section. Uh, you need to look at the the alignment in relation to that. Uh, you know, vertical and horizontal alignment of the uh, uh, the highway or the railway, um, and you know what uh, um, what slopes you can contend with, um, what gradients climbing into and out of the tunnel. Um, then there is the choice of material. Um, most people have chosen concrete. Um, but uh, you could choose uh, hybrid steel concrete, or you could uh, could choose steel only. But um, concrete has the benefit of uh, providing um, a certain amount of mass, so that um, it, it's probably easier to achieve uh, a near neutrally buoyant um, tunnel section if you uh, if you adopt concrete as a structural material. And then to proceed with the design, obviously there's a a huge amount of analysis involved um, in, uh, in the design of the mooring system and the design of the, the tunnel section. Um, time history analysis to look at uh, 
how the uh, um, the tunnel section will will move as environmental loads are applied, uh, and obviously that feeds into design, uh, and you have to achieve the uh, the safety margins um, and the, the safety level uh, in design that uh, you are targeting. Um, so just looking at the basic design theory, uh, important um, measure of SFTBs is a buoyancy to weight ratio. And if it's supported at the surface, um, then you, uh, your buoyancy is at the surface and you want to make your tunnel section um, slightly heavy in that uh, you want it to sink. Um, whereas if you've got a tether supported system, you need your um, tunnel sections uh, to be net buoyant so that they're pulling up on the tethers uh, and the tethers should never go slack. Then looking at cross-section design, uh, depending on the shape you, you select, um, um, the section is going to be subjected to quite a large hydrostatic load uh, and you should be uh, aiming to avoid too much bending in the section. Uh, this section, elliptical section, has quite a bit of bending um, to uh, to contend with, uh, and obviously you've got to um, balance that against uh, the benefits say, of a, an elliptical shape. It may give you less uh, lateral loading due to uh, due to the environment. Um, then you need to think about uh, how far to span between the uh, the supports. Um, you've got um, the net buoyancy acting versus the, uh, the tension in the tethers here. Um, so you have a beam spanning, you know, maybe 200 meters between uh, intermediate supports. So your section, you know, has to be able to uh, carry uh, all the loading and bending and shear between the sections there. And, you know, conventionally um, longitudinal post-tensioning will be adopted to ensure that you maintain those uh, through thickness um, stresses within compression under the service loads, as I, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Now, looking at the influence of wave loading, um, the, uh, the further you, uh, you have the, the tunnel below the waterline, the smaller the, uh, the environmental loads on it from waves are going to be. Um, but you find if you, if you have swell waves, they can actually penetrate quite a long way below the waterline. Um, but um, generally, you'd be looking for, say, 30 meters um, clearance above the tunnel for uh, things like um, navigation considerations. Um, and then the design is a balance between the hydrostatic pressure you're going to have to design the section for, uh, perhaps versus uh, reducing the environmental load that it's going to experience. So there, there's a choice there in terms of how far you have the tunnel below the waterline. And then moving into um, the chapter on construction, uh, and I mentioned earlier that the uh, SFTB technology um, draws from uh, experience in offshore structures construction um, over the last uh, you know, 50 years, uh, concrete offshore platforms. Um, it also draws from immersed tunnel experience, and it combines that with a need for mooring and anchoring. And uh, you put all those elements together and uh, you can construct uh, an SFTB. So um, a typical construction yard based on uh, immersed tunnel uh, technology could have a, a two-stage um, construction where you start off constructing in the dry. Um, you move the structure in two stages um, to eventually um, get out into this deep basin here, um, where um, from which you uh, you trans transfer along and out through a, a floating gate in deep part. So there's, it starts off uh, at one level, goes to uh, a lower level, and then drops down into a, a deeper basin. To and that's a technique used for uh, immersed tunnels. So that that can be uh, employed again. You do need a large construction yard for uh, all the uh, all the segments you're going to need of the structure. Um, you could also build in a in a dry dock, uh, as you could with uh, 
SFT uh, um, immersed tunnel uh, elements as shown here. And then thinking about installation. Now, this is not like an offshore structure installation where you just have one structure typically, which you uh, have to uh, uh, plan to uh, transport and install. The, uh, the amount of planning and logistics associated with uh, uh, an SFTB is much more complicated because the, uh, um, there is a degree of uh, offshore installation work. You need to join segments together. Uh, you're going to be uh, exposed to the environment for a much longer period. And you've got to get a workforce to the, uh, to the site to, to be able to um, progress the work. Um, so um, there's an awful lot more planning involved and there's a lot more things to do actually for installation, um, mooring and anchor the structures and any sort of temporary facilities you might need to um, um, temporarily support the elements during, uh, during um, the construction and installation offshore. So uh, one method that can be used again, draws from immersed tube tunnel uh, construction. Um, and these would have to be made a little bit more robust for a, a more open sea uh, deployment um, where you have barges straddling um, the immersed tube unit and it's then lowered um, with an immersed tunnel to the seabed, but here lowered, lowered to its, uh, its target draft. Um, you need to join the sections together and um, various ways have been postulated for doing this, but uh, the, most of them assume that you are going to, you need to put post tensioning across the joint. So you need a, a form of temporary seal. And the, this could be the um, Gina gasket type seal you see on an immersed tunnel. Um, dewatering followed by um, joining the sections together and uh, stressing them all together and grouting to form a, a continuous section. And a key difference here to a, an immersed tunnel is that um, you are putting a full strength joint between the sections. You can't just rely on um, the, um, the, the gasket and, uh, and uh, you know, a ceiling plate to join the sections together as you would in an immersed tunnel. Um, you have to have full structural continuity. Uh, then there's a chapter on uh, technical in installations. These are called different things in different countries, but uh, um, all the facilities like traffic management, uh, the ventilation um, and structural health monitoring um, provisions, provisions to um, pump out any water that seeps into the structure. Um, they all need to be designed and uh, and provided for. Um, then there's some guidance on operation and maintenance uh, about choice of materials, uh, about um, how often you might need to inspect the elements, um, design of the ba ballasting system, um, and things like fire protection systems. There's a chapter on risk and reliability, uh, and the key key thing to recognize here is that um, you're going to have to address human public perceptions. Uh, the public may not be uh, too confident about uh, using um, a submerged tunnel initially. So um, um, work needs to be put into uh, evaluating the risks and, and mitigating the risks of flooding and also conveying that to, uh, to the public so that uh, they can begin to, you know, appreciate uh, how this structure might uh, might behave compared to, uh, you know, a, a conventional tunnel that they may have uh, used in the past. Um, and <clears throat> the usual hierarchy of risk supply, and um, the methods of evaluating risks will be the same as, as in in any uh, infrastructure project. Uh, looking at costs. Um, it's um, not an easy task to, uh, to cost uh, these um, submerged floating tunnels uh, compared to uh, alternative technologies, but I've tried to give an indication here with a sort of a benchmark of HS2, the sort of unit one here. 
And um, if you rent for a, a floating bridge, you can probably do that for a little less money than you can build a, a HS2 railway. Um, but um, uh, an SFT is going to be significantly more costly um, than that. And uh, what can make it economic is whether there is need for a, a high navigation span. Um, if, if you have a, an alternative floating bridge and you need to provide 70 meters clearance for, um, for vessels, then um, if you're doing that with a bridge, then the costs would escalate dramatically. Um, and if you use a, a, a bridge in combination with a floating, uh, uh, um, a suspension bridge in conjunction with a navigation span, then it does appear to be a little bit more expensive than an SFTB. Uh, but uh, these won't be uh, uh, won't be cheap applications. But it does seem that the SFTB um, can compete against alternative concepts, particularly when there is this need for um, um, passage of uh, large vessels on the crossing. Um, now, where might we uh, um, see a, an SFTB uh, deployed? Um, well, I hope. You're all aware of uh, the E39 project in Norway, uh, which is a, a plan to make ferry free crossings between Kristiansand in the south and Trondheim in the mid country of uh, Norway. And at the moment, I think there are something like 20, uh, 20 crossings. Uh, and the plan is to um, make it ferry free uh, along that, uh, that whole highway. Um, and a number of the, uh, the um, fjord crossings perhaps Sula Fjord um, might be a good candidate for uh, an SFTB. Um, but you know, decisions between floating bridges and uh, SFTBs are still to be made on uh, many of these crossings. Uh, will we see one in the UK? Uh, well, there has been talk about um, uh, connecting um, the uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, it's about 34 kilometers across, uh, if you go um, um, more or less the shortest distance, uh, but it is quite a challenging crossing. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a very difficult uh, in terms of political um, decisions um, to, um, to uh, promote and uh, see some sort of crossing like that uh, to come, come to pass. Uh, another uh, place where this technology could be employed and has been considered is um, at the moment, um, the Asian Development Bank is, is um, looking at how the connectivity of the various islands of the Philippines could be improved. Uh, and um, this technology has been looked at uh, joining two islands of Sorsagon and Samar. Um, but um, that's uh, again, in early, the early stage of consideration at the moment. Um, so finally, I'd like to uh, uh, thank my uh, co-authors of the document. Uh, they're all listed here. I won't read them all out, the corresponding authors. But in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Ariana Minaretti, who is our convener from the Norwegian Public Roads Administration. Um, she did a great job in, uh, in making sure that we uh, did deliver these, uh, these guidelines to time, and uh, they're now uh, available for all all of you to use thank you